Bonsoir. Good evening. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Such great numbers for this conference uh, with Paul Collier here in Ottawa in this uh, extremely beautiful room of the uh, National Gallery of Canada. For joining us this evening for uh, this lecture by Paul Collier. Um, we are celebrating at Canada's International Development Research Centre our 40th anniversary. You may know that IDRC is a crown corporation. We are uh, one component, a small component relative to some of the others, of Canada's external aid program. So we uh, devote our resources to funding research in the developing world on issues that are critical to the development tracks of the countries involved. Uh, one of the programs we've been working on, which Paul has been kind enough to help us with, is called the Think Tank Initiative. It's a partnership between the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, IDRC, and the British uh, Department for International Development, aiming to do much the same thing in the developing world, but the effort is focused on building up the core capacity of research institutions in the developing world to produce evidence-based advice and findings that uh, governments in their countries and in their regions may use. And Paul agreed to be a member of the International Advisory Group of that initiative, which explains why he's in Ottawa this evening, because uh, the Think Tank Initiative Group has been meeting in Ottawa today. I think Paul Collier is known to many of you as an economist, as an Africanist, and as a very successful author. Early in his life, he focused on publishing in obscure journals, and I was one of the few people who used to read him in obscure journals. Uh, happily, about 10 years ago, he decided uh, to make a very big effort to make his work and his ideas accessible. And the first uh, output of that effort, which came out, I think, about four years ago, was a book called The Bottom Billion, which focused on the very poorest countries and um, their particular plight. More recently, uh, he's been working on uh, inv the, the juncture point between uh, economics and uh, environmental constraints and opportunities. So we thought it would be a great opportunity for all of us uh, this evening to hear Paul on the subject, but also for Paul to hear from you. And uh, we may be joined uh, through the web by some who are not in the room this evening. We'll see about that later on. Meanwhile, Paul, the podium is yours, and many thanks for being with us. David, thanks for inviting me, and thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about my new book, The Plundered Planet, just out this last week. And I want to persuade you that this is the most important book that I've written. Whether it's the best, you'll have to judge, read it. But I'm sure it's the most important. What it's about is nature, and nature mismanaged. It's an attempt to build common ground between environmentalists and economists. And building that common ground is vital because, as I'll explain, what's happening at the moment is that nature, natural assets, natural liabilities is being plundered. Now, in building common ground between cat and dog, environmentalists and economists, we're going to lose the fringes. And let's just accept that. We're going to lose the fundamentalist fringe of the environmentalists, and we're going to lose the ostrich fringe of the economists. Right? 
but we're going to try and build a common ground for the broad mass in the center. That that's very much was the spirit of, of what I did in the bottom billion, try and build a robust center ground, because it's the center ground that can change policy. So why does nature matter? Well, nature is valuable, and it's vulnerable. Let me borrow from the environmentalists one really important insight which economists actually don't have, and that is that nature is special. Now, the reason nature's special is that natural assets have no natural owners. If you think about it, most assets, all the man-made assets, the process of making the asset defines the initial ownership. Yeah? But natural assets are not made by us, they're just there. And so, in the absence of governance, they are up for grabs, they're up for plunder. And let me, plunder's a big emotive word, and I'm a, a little pedantic economist, so I'm going to give this big emotive word a very precise meaning. What do I mean by plunder? I mean two forms of behavior. One is where the few expropriate what should belong to the many. And anybody who's been interested in development will have seen again and again nature plundered in that way. Natural assets that should benefit all citizens instead being exploited to benefit a narrow elite and some foreign companies. And that's one form of plunder that people concerned with development are very conscious of. But environmentalists are conscious of a different form of plunder, and that is where the present generation expropriates what should belong to the future. And both of these forms of plunder matter. And without adequate governance, natural assets and natural liabilities are going to be subject to one or other of these forms of plunder. Governance matters, and if we look globally, there are two huge holes in the governance of natural assets and natural liabilities. One of those holes is in the poorest societies on Earth, the countries I call the bottom billion. There, weak governance meets very valuable natural assets. Natural assets dominate the economies of these societies. And so the weak governance is stressed beyond the point of endurance. And so repeatedly in these societies, what's happened to nature is plunder. So that's one hole in governance. The other hole in governance is those natural assets and liabilities which don't have the decency to respect our man-made frontiers. They're transnational assets and liabilities. They're the fish of the oceans. They're the carbon of the skies. They're the stuff beneath the oceans. They're the stuff beneath the Arctic and the Antarctic. Right? To date, to the extent that those things have been protected, they've not been protected by rules. They've been protected by the absence of technology to plunder them. And now, technology is advancing. Over the next two or three decades, technology will open up so that all those resources are up for grabs. So these are the two holes in governance that really, really have to be addressed. And that's what the book is about. I'm going to talk a little about each of them this evening. And let me start with that first hole in governance. The, the poorest societies on earth. And what I want to convince you of is that the misgovernance, the governance of natural assets is of first order importance for these societies. It's more important than any other issue in these societies. And to convince you, I'm going to give you the one number that I guarantee in a year's time you'll remember from what I've said tonight. And we're going to start not with 
the poorest countries on earth, but the richest. We're going to take the club of the rich, the OECD. Collectively, the club of the rich are about a quarter of the Earth's land surface. So there's a, a quadrant of the Earth which is occupied by the club of the rich. And we're going to take the average square kilometer of that territory. And we're going to look beneath it. Beneath the average square kilometer of the OECD is about $120,000 worth of subsoil assets, the minerals and stuff that's valuable. So remember that, $120,000. And now we're going to move to Africa. Right? And we're going to take that same idea, the average square kilometer of Africa, and we're going to look beneath it. And what's the number? And to make it more interesting, you're going to tell me. Um, and to make it manageable, I'm going to give you a choice. Right? The average square kilometer of Africa, Africa it could, be, it could be less than the OECD, and it could be more than the OECD. And you're going to vote on it now. So who thinks that in Africa it's less? And who thinks in Africa it's more? And this is why you're going to remember it, because you're all wrong. <laughs> Let me assure you, you're in good company, right? I gave this same test um, just this time last week to um, a group in London, 250 uh, investment fund managers from around the world. They were the chief executives of the biggest pension funds and investment funds in the world. There were trillions of dollars in this room. You'd think they knew what they were doing. They all, to a man and woman, got it wrong. Right? And then uh, also last week I addressed all the representatives of the donors um, in, the, in the World Bank's uh, uh, IDA round of, of, of raising money. So this was all the donors. They also all got it wrong. So in good company, but I have to tell you, not only are you wrong, you're very wrong. Right? The actual number for that square kilometer of Africa is not $120,000, it's about $23,000. It's about a fifth. Right? Now think about that. In one sense, it's really unlikely because there's this huge quadrant of the Earth the rich countries, another almost huge quadrant of the Earth, Africa, and the chances of st that statistically what's underneath is so very different is really pretty unlikely, right? I mean, this is geology that happened millions and millions of years ago, right? You know what? I cheated. Um, the figures I gave you were, were for known subsoil assets. You know, I tried to find the figures for unknown subsoil assets, and I just couldn't find it. <laughs> and so, so that should give you a clue, right? It's not that there's less down there. It's that there's been less discovered. It's been less discovered because there's been a whole lot less search. Right? Now, you all put your hands up for more because already the big story for Africa and the other countries of the bottom billion is resource extraction. It dominates their economies. But now, think what's going to happen. We're facing historically very high global commodity prices, despite the biggest world recession we've had for 80 years. Right? World commodity prices are going to stay high. And that's triggered a search process. And where is the last frontier on Earth to find natural assets? It's the countries of the bottom billion. Over the next decade or so, by hook or by crook, those resources will be found. By hook or by crook, and probably by crook, right? Now, that will be a flow of trillions of dollars into the societies of the bottom billion or at least a flow of trillions of dollars worth of natural assets out of them, such as we've never seen. 
It is their biggest single opportunity for transformation out of poverty to sustain prosperity. But it's a one-shot game. Once those assets are depleted, the opportunity's gone. If, we, if history repeats itself, it won't just be the biggest opportunity they've ever had, it will be the biggest missed opportunity. Because to date, the history of resource extraction in these societies has been plunder. So, the first order issue by far for these societies is to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself. History doesn't have to repeat itself. You may have noticed what's going on in Europe at the moment, right? The, the, the Germans versus the Greeks, etc. right? The Germans are famously the society in Europe that is most averse to inflation. They'll do anything to avoid inflation. Why are they so averse to inflation? Because they lived through a hyperinflation and they learned, right? Societies can learn from past mistakes. So, the societies of the bottom billion know that their resources in the past have been plundered. Here's this huge opportunity, but what mistakes have to be corrected? What decisions have to be got right to harness natural resources instead of plundering them? And now there's nothing for it but to take the long march through the decision chain of how to harness natu natural assets for prosperity. The first link in that chain you already know is broken. We just don't know you know. Because that first link is discover your natural assets. The very fact that so few have been discovered relative to what's there tells you that that link historically has been broken. I'm not going to fuss about that tonight because I think somehow or other these resources are going to be discovered. So let me move on to the next link in the chain, which is how do you capture the value of those natural assets for the whole society? How do you avoid plunder of type one, the few expropriating what should belong to the many? Let me give you a figure. In fact, I, I, I just uh, gave it on um, Canadian Broadcasting Television tonight at 5.30, so some of you may have heard it, but um, it's uh, the interviewer asked me about uh, the Congo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, which incidentally is neither democratic nor a republic. Um, and so here's, here's the figure for, 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 in Eastern DRC, there's about a billion dollars worth of gold being extracted each year, exported. Some of it by Toronto finance companies. Right? Toronto is the biggest centre in the world for financing resource extraction. Um, so there's a billion dollars going out of the DRC, Eastern DRC gold. What's the revenues from gold exports going into the treasury of DRC? We could take another vote on it, but we won't. I'll give you the number. $37,000. A billion goes out, 37,000 comes in. Right? This is plunder on the grand scale, and it's happening now. Right? So that's link two in this chain, designing an effective tax system which captures these revenues for the society. Right? And it's not there. It can be designed, it can be done, but it's not there at the moment. I could have given you loads of other numbers from other countries. So let's move to the third link in the chain. The third link in the chain can best be summarized as avoid the Niger Delta. The Niger Delta has turned into an environmental and social disaster. For years, Oil was taken out of the delta with too little concern for the environmental consequences. And that 
led to immiserization of the local population because nor did they benefit in any of the revenues. Right? Now, unfortunately, that has produced such anger in the population of the Delta that it's produced large-scale organized violence and it's produced what I think of as a false demand. The, the population of the Niger Delta now says it's our oil. And that move is wrong. Because if you go to the idea of local ownership of the stuff below the ground, then natural assets are going to be very unequally owned. Africa's already chopped up into 53 countries, and that's producing big inequities. The tiny little country of Sao Tome, Principe, 100,000 people, is sitting on an oil field. Ethiopia, 80 million people, nothing. So even nations, it's bad enough. But if we move to the subnational, if we say little local areas can own the valuable stuff, uh, we'll get radically high inequality, and also there's no limit. Let's take that little nation of Sao Tome Principe, 100,000 people. It's actually two islands, Sao Tome and Principe. You know what? The people live on one island, and the oil is underneath the other island. So guess what the 8,000 people on Principe are saying? They're saying, it's ours. Right? There's no limit to greed once you go down that route of local ownership. Right? So the Niger Delta has a legitimate grievance which should have been addressed. It should have been addressed partly by minimizing the environmental damage, partly by compensating for that damage which was irreducible, but mainly by ensuring that the citizens of the Niger Delta could benefit equally with the citizens of, of the rest of Nigeria in the benefits. And here's where I'm going to part company from the fundamentalist environmentalists. I distinguish between fundamentalism and humane environmentalism. And the difference is that the fundamentalists think that people are for nature and the humane environmentalists think that nature should be properly used for people. The fundamentalists seem to see the objective, our role, as being sort of curators of a set of natural artifacts which we have to preserve at all costs and hand the museum on to the future. Now, if you take that position, and I'm afraid a lot of young people at the moment are attracted by this romantic fundamentalist environmentalism. It's become a sort of new religion. If you take that position, it's fundamentally opposed to the task of reducing global poverty. There's quite a different way of thinking through environmentalism. And that is to say, we have a responsibility to protect the rights of the future. We must not infringe the rights of the future. But what are the rights to the future? The rights to the future are to the value of natural assets, not literally, necessarily, to the particular set of natural artifacts. Here's the thought experiment which you can go through to test whether, you, whether we in the present are behaving ethically. I should say a thought experiment is the equivalent in moral philosophy to the scientific experiment in science. Right? And the thought experiment is this. Put yourself in the position of a future generation and say, if the present generation uses natural assets, does that infringe my rights? And the answer is, it depends what the present generation does with them. If you're Nigerians, and at the moment you're in real poverty, and the best chance that the future has to get out of poverty is to take that oil out of the ground and convert it into more productive assets, into the schools, into the factories, into the ports 
that make the future generation prosperous instead of poor, then the future generation is going to say, take the oil out of the ground. Don't preserve things. So that's what I would argue is a, is a proper ethical framework for being responsible about nature. We're not curators of a set of natural artifacts. We're custodians of natural value. Let me say that that concept of being custodians of value rather than curators of artifacts echoes in a lot of different cultures. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, the Christian framework. Those of you who know the parable of the talents in Luke, think about that parable of the talents. What's it saying? If you remember, the, the, the master goes away, leaves talents, money, with his stewards, and then he comes back. And he says, what have you done? And one steward has literally preserved the talents. He's wrapped them up. And he unwraps the talents and says, there, there. And the master doesn't say, well done for preserving the talents. He's chastised this guy. He says, basically, you idiot. Yeah? The stewards who are praised are the ones who've used those talents and fructified them. So the Christian concept of stewardship is not preservation. It's harnessing value. And then if we go to the radically different ethical framework of Islam, there's only one democratic Islamic society, and that's Kuwait. And what have they done? They've taken the oil out of the ground, but they've used the revenues from that oil to accumulate a future generations fund. Because they recognize within the framework of Islam that it's ethically essential to meet the obligations of the future by passing on value. Not you pass on the oil, you pass on the value. And finally, the societies I'm most familiar with, Africa. Now, most African governments haven't behaved like Kuwait. But ordinary Africans are not cheering their governments on for having plundered the future. They're really angry. As, a, as, a, as one of my Zambian friends said to me, when the copper has run out, what are our children going to say about us? And so this sense of custodianship of value to the future is, I think, ethically a pretty common principle. In the case of the Niger Delta, it would mean that the, the Nigerian government should commit transparently to using the revenues from oil to benefit all the, the, the nation's children. How can it do that? Well, let's move on to the fourth link in the chain. And the fourth link in the chain is what do you do with the revenues? Well, you save them. You're depleting a natural asset by taking it out of the ground. And so you need to accumulate some other asset, something which is more productive. Right? At the moment, usually in the poorest countries, that doesn't happen. Right? Nigeria took out billions of dollars of oil from 1970 until the present. And except for one brief episode, there was practically no savings accumulation at all. I met the new Nigerian finance minister about three weeks ago. His first question to me, he's a really good guy, his first question was, are we saving enough out of the oil revenues in Nigeria? Well, at the moment, the he's just been appointed finance minister. The situation he's inherited is that the oil revenues are just covering recurrent expenditure. Yeah. Savings, zero. Yeah. Let's move on to the final link, which is, OK, you save the money. What do you do with the savings? And here, unfortunately, the model of prudence is Norway. Do you know 50 governments of developing countries have asked Norway for advice. And in one sense, that's good. It suggests they want to be prudent. But actually, it's very bad news, because what Norway does is right for Norway, but it's wrong for a low-income country. What Norway does is get the oil out of the ground and give the revenues to those wise New York bankers to manage. Right? And whether that's sensible for Norway, the, the basic idea, which is sensible, is that 
Norway literally has more invested capital per worker than any other country in the world. And so piling on yet more capital in Norway wouldn't be very productive. It makes more sense for Norwegians to acquire assets to capital in Canada than to capital in Norway or to capital wherever in the world. And that's what they're doing. But of course, for a country like Sierra Leone, which has just discovered oil, I was there in December, it would be obscene for Sierra Leone to acquire claims on other people's capital. There's been no investment in Sierra Leone for 40 years. You arrive and it hits you. There's, Freetown is a city without infrastructure. It's still trying to function on the infrastructure of a small town in the 1950s. And there's over a million people there. So this final link in the chain is that the savings have to be invested in the country. And that's difficult because at the moment, many of these countries, one reason why they don't invest is they don't have the capacity to invest productively. The IMF famously for years has, has banged on about this, calling it absorptive capacity constraints. And in one sense, they're right. But the conclusion that the IMF drew from this for years and years, which is put the money abroad, do a Norway. That's the wrong conclusion. The right conclusion is fix the constraints, build the capacity to invest productively. I call that final phase investing in investing, building the capacity to invest. Now, there's the decision chain. It's a long chain. It is a chain in the sense that it's a weakest link problem. If any of the links in that chain don't hold, you've got a broken chain. You can't lift the society from poverty to prosperity. Worse than that, that chain of decisions has got to hold not just once, but again and again for at least a generation. There are no quick transformations in economics. The generation is as quick as it'll get. So how can that whole decision chain hold again and again for a generation? I'm going to leave that question with you for a moment and move to that other hole in governance of natural assets and liabilities. The hole created by the fact that Many natural assets and liabilities don't respect our frontiers. Right? Now, I could give you lots of examples of this, but I'm going to take one where uh, it's, a minor, it's a minor natural asset which most people haven't got up to speed on. Perhaps you have, in which case I apologize, but I'm going to talk about fish. Right? Fish don't come with passports. Right? They just swim around without passports. They're, they're not national, especially the fish of the high seas, the fish of the oceans, and that's what I'm going to focus on. And fish is, uh, is a minor tragedy. Right? Um, it's, it'll only take you five minutes to get up to speed on fish if you're not up to speed already. And once you're up to speed, you'll be horrified. Right? Here's, here's, here's the fish story, the five-minute fish story. There's a chapter in the Plundered Planet, but we can do it in five minutes. Um, until a few years ago, there was no problem with fish because the technology for catching fish wasn't that good. And so fish could just renew themselves. You could go and catch as many fish as you wanted, and it didn't exhaust the stock. The fish could renew. And now the technology of catching fish has got better and better. Now it's super, right? You go around with basically with a hoover over the ocean and you scoop them up, you know? You suck them up. With that technology, if we use it without restraint, there'll be no fish. This is plunder of type two. There will be no fish for our grandchildren. Now, once you pose it that way, the, the, the ethical test of what will the future want, this is very straightforward. Right? If we go to that future 
and say, sorry, we're, we're going to eat all the fish, but don't worry, we'll give you some other assets. Right? We'll give you a lot of video games. Right? What's the future going to say? They're going to say, we're awash with video games. Right? Or they're going to say, video games? We moved on from that. Right? We want fish. Right? So in this case, the ethical obligation to the future is indeed to preserve the natural asset. Yeah? The difference between Nigeria's oil and fish shows why we've got to be pragmatic environmentalists. You can't just deduce that preservation is a matter of first principle. You have to deduce it case by case, what is best for the future. And in the case of fish, it's obvious, preserve the fish. Now, to preserve the fish in the face of our brilliant technology for catching them, we're going to have to restrict the catching of fish in some way or other. Once you restrict the catching of fish, you create what economists call rents. That is, the right to catch those fish becomes really valuable. I'll get you up to speed in the idea of rents very fast. Think of a barrel of oil. A barrel of oil costs about $7 to get out of the ground. That's the total cost, the capital cost, the risk, the labor cost, the lot. Once you've got it out of the ground, it's worth at the moment about $70. So $63 of that is not a return on capital, it's not a return on labor, it's not a return on anything. It's just the intrinsic value of the barrel of oil. That's the rent, and it's that $63 which should accrue to the citizens of the country where the oil's found. And now fish, once you restrict the catch, fish there's a rent component in their value. The fish, world fishing industry is not very big. It's about $80 billion a year industry. In the book, I conservatively estimate the value of rents on fish at about a quarter of that, about $20 billion. I just got an email from a, a research team yesterday saying, well, actually, we think uh, you've underestimated. We think it's $50 billion, right? But Let's be conservative, 20 billion, right? So who should, who should get the, the benefit, who should get that 20 billion, right? Should it be fishermen? Why, why? You know, fishermen at the moment get it because they say, but we were allowed to catch fish in the past, we should be allowed to catch fish without paying for it in the future. And that is a fundamentally false ethical move. You can recognize the same false ethical move, incidentally, in climate change, where the Chinese say, because Europe and North America emitted carbon in the 19th century, we should be able to do it in the 21st without restraint. False ethical move. It's the difference between a, a period of abundance and a period of scarcity. Okay? Once you're into a period of scarcity, there's rents, and the rents have to be allocated okay? and controlled. So, why should the fishermen get the rents? They belong to everybody, to the extent that they belong to anybody. Right? So in an ideal world, fishermen would pay the rest of us about $20 billion for the rights to catch those fish. Instead, you know what? Instead of them paying us, we pay them. Globally, we give fishermen $30 billion a year in fishing subsidies, 30 billion. Right? So instead of them paying us, we pay them. What do they do with that $30 billion? You know what? They catch fish. Right? They plunder the fish stock. So we're subsidizing the extinction of a lot of fish. Right? It's costing us a fortune. Instead of getting the $20 billion, we're giving 30 And we're, in the process, violating our obligations to the future. So that's the, uh, the fish story. Um, could it be different? Of course it could. Um, we need to, to, contain, to, to, to con contain the, uh, the fish catch. Um, how can we do that? In the book, I make a simple suggestion that it's very hard to police the oceans at the moment. We just don't have the technology to police the catching of fish. It doesn't matter. What has to happen to a fish 
between being taken out of the sea and being eaten on your plate. Don't think of the image of a single fisherman fishing in a river. Think of these great commercial fleets hoovering things up. What do they do with the fish? What do they have to do before it reaches your plate? The answer is they have to price it. It has to go through a wholesale market. If anything that goes through a wholesale market to be priced can also be taxed. What we need is a globally agreed rate of tax on fish that reduces the consumption to the sustainable rate of offtake. So that's the simple story of fish. The, the tragedy is that it's taken, what, five minutes to get you to realize that if we don't do something, we will fundamentally violate our obligations to our own grandchildren. And yet, at the moment, nothing's happening. Right? If we can't get fish right, we haven't a hope of getting the more complicated and more valuable natural asset regulation right for carbon, for the, the enormously valuable natural resources that will be under the oceans and under the poles. Right? So, Here's the second challenge. How do we get fish right, and more generally, all these transnational assets? So I've parked two questions. How do the societies of the bottom billion get this decision chain right? How do the, does the international community get the regulation of the transnational assets and liabilities right? And now let me answer them. In the case of the bottom billion, and indeed, in the case of the transnational assets, there is no substitute for building a critical mass of informed citizens who actually understand that decision chain, who understand whether it's the science or the economics, and understand why it matters enormously to them. How big does a critical mass have to be? It doesn't have to be the whole population, right? It depends on how decisions are taken. Let's define a critical mass as a big enough group of people to make those decisions go right. And that has to be done both society by society in the countries of the bottom billion and in the countries that matter for the plunder of natural assets internationally, which is our own societies. Can we build such a critical mass? Well, here's the good news. Technology is really on our side. 10, 20 years ago, it would have been hopeless. And let me draw to a close with a story of, uh, of a society that is much more repressive than pretty well any of the societies of the bottom billion, and certainly than any in the OECD, and that's China. You remember a couple of years ago, 2008, there were earthquakes in China, and because of those earthquakes, schools fell down and killed school children. And the reason the schools fell down was that they'd been very badly built, there'd been a lot of corruption, building regulations had been evaded. Within 48 hours of that earthquake, ordinary Chinese citizens had managed to do three things. The first was they found out why the schools fell down. They used the net. The second was they found out who within their local government had taken the bribes that meant that the schools didn't satisfy building regulations. And three, still within 48 hours, they had organized amongst themselves protests against those corrupt local government officials. If you search the web, you'll find a wonderful photograph of a Chinese local government official on his knees in the street before a crowd of angry parents. If that can happen in China two years ago, think what can happen in the societies of the bottom billion in the coming decade. They've got the information technology now. In many cases, they've got information technology which is better than our own. Google sent a team to Kenya recently, not to show the Kenyans how to do all this new technology, but to learn from the Kenyans how to do it because the Kenyans, lacking ordinary means of coordination and communication, had leapfrogged and invented things, invent, invented uses of the new technologies. 
So, one task is to ignite that process of putting out information. That's why I wrote The Plunder Planet, is to try and help build a critical mass of informed citizens. I've also, as, just as, as one citizen amongst many, a group of us have come together to build a website called the Natural Resource Charter. You can all visit it, naturalresourcecharter.org, which sets out that decision chain in clear language for ordinary citizens in the, the poorest countries. We need that critical mass of informed citizens, not just in the bottom billion, but in our own rich societies, to understand things like fish. Until we've got a critical mass that understands these issues, our political leaders will just go to these international conferences and come back posturing how well they've defended the national interest and sacrificed the global interest. We have to build a critical mass of people who prevent politicians doing that. Now, why am I in Canada? I'm in Canada partly for the meeting that David invited me to, but most especially because Canada has the leading role in building an, a critical mass of informed citizens that will discipline leaders to take action. And let me close by explaining why Canada really matters. You matter twice over. You are the only G8 country that is really and truly resource rich. You have a leadership role in the management of natural resources. What's more, you don't have all the colonial baggage of most of the other G8 members, and so your leadership role will not be seen as an intrusion by the, the people who struggle in the societies of the bottom billion to make sure that their own said history doesn't repeat itself. But that's not the end of Canada's leadership role. You're also, in Toronto, you have the world's biggest financial market for financing resource extraction companies, the new wave of resource extraction companies. I'm not asking Canada to be a solitary saint. Right. What I'm asking is that you take a leadership role in building the basic governance that is ethical in the harnessing of natural assets. Think back to that Eastern DRC and the extraction of gold. You'd have to stand upside down before you could say that's ethical. Right. It doesn't take saintliness to recognize that something has to be done. It's no good saying it's just a problem for the government of DRC. It's their job to enforce. They're not able to. They've got the legislation. They're not able to enforce it. We, as an international community, not just Canada, but Canada has to lead the international community. You have to have a dialogue with the Chinese to build a set of common ethical principles and make sure we adhere by them. They'll first build the principles and then enforce them. Let me close with a, a story of, of the failure to enforce and what it means. Ten years ago, the OECD passed legislation to prevent bribery in poor countries. And uh, my own country of Britain, the government has a disgraceful record of failure to enforce. It's actually brought only one prosecution in an entire decade. I know because I was brought in by the Serious Fraud Office to be the, the expert witness for the prosecution. But it only came to prosecution because the management of the company changed. And the new management was so horrified by what the old management had got up to that they came to the Serious Fraud Office and said, please prosecute the company so that we can get rid of this, uh, this stain. Right? That's the only prosecution Britain's brought. I was hired as expert witness to say what the costs were. And what the prosecutors thought I would say was, oh, this, is, this raised the costs of these projects, they were little construction projects, by 15%. It costs this country an extra $7 million. 
And that wasn't what I said at all. That wasn't the cost. What happened to this $7 million? It was paid as bribes to a mid-level official in the Ministry of Public Works. What did that guy do with his $7 million? He didn't go and spend it on high living. It would be much better if he had done. He invested it. He invested it in power. He built a patronage system, a political patronage system. He became an MP. By the time the case came to the courts, he was his country's Minister of Transport. What's the cost of having a crook as your Minister of Transport? It's a lot more than $7 million. Right? And just think, this company's carelessness in that bribe denied an honest person the chance of guiding transport policy in that country. That is our ethical responsibility. We don't have to be saints to recognize that inflicting damage on the poorest societies on earth in that way is just wrong. So I appeal to you, please read The Plundered Planet. It's an attempt to ignite, get a catalytic process of information spreading around our own societies and into the societies of the bottom billion. Please be in the vanguard of that process. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you again for joining us for this uh, terrific lecture by Paul Collier. There are a couple of microphones halfway up or down the stairs on either side. If you have a comment or a question, would you please go to a microphone, identify yourself, and um, uh, please tell us what's on your mind. Et si vous désirez poser... And if you wish to ask a question in French, please do not hesitate. And I will try to, uh, to interpret it, although I think Paul speaks very good French in any case. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Catherine Cummins. I work for an organization called Mining Watch Canada. Mining Watch Canada is part of a coalition called the Canadian Network on Corporate Accountability. And we have been um, strongly supporting a bill in Canada called Bill C-300. And I just want to take a moment to reflect on some of the things you said. I think like fish, oops, excuse me, like fish, um, mining companies don't respect borders either. They go where they like. And I was struck by your uh, discussion of the governance gap or the governance problem and also of your discussion of Canada's responsibility. Um, I see that responsibility um, as something that we can't wait until Canada builds international regulatory regimes or supports international legal systems by which people can bring complaints forward. Those things are important. I think we have a role to play there, but I think the urgency of the situation is such that we need to, in Canada, start regulating any way we can, the behavior of our mining companies when they operate overseas. And we can do that. We can do that through something like Bill C-300, which specifically looks at the role of Canadian public funds in supporting, in subsidizing, as you put it, those, the activities of those companies, and says that that support, that public support, will not be granted to companies that don't meet high environmental and human rights standards. And I'd like to know um, whether you're familiar with Bill C-300 and whether you have any reflections on this bill and this attempt, or whether you know of other examples around the world where national governments are saying we're going to start taking action at home for what our companies are doing overseas. Yeah. Canada has a leadership role internationally. And think what taking that leadership role means. It's very simple. Right? You cannot afford to say, do as I say, not as I do. If that's the message, you won't lead anybody anywhere. And so leading international community means taking the first step. And so 
Yes, I commend. You, 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 you've got to put your own house in order before you try and put the global house in order. We have to put the global house in order. Thank you. Thank you. I see there's a gentleman by the microphone there. Why don't you go ahead and then we'll go to the gentleman here, please. Uh, hello, Mr. Colley. Thank you for uh, being here and uh, speaking. Uh, my name is Peter Mihailenko. I'm with an organize, uh, with a university chapter or an organization called Engineers Without Borders. Uh, we work with uh, promoting um, infrastructure development in some countries in Africa. Uh, my question was, uh, you mentioned uh, that that all of the rents from natural resources uh, of a country should go to promoting infrastructure, promoting the future of the country. Uh, my question would be, how, uh, how could we make that happen without making some kind of nationalization of resources reforms in the country? Yeah, I mean, the, the, at the moment, the, um, the nearest we're getting to that is actually the Chinese deals of resource extraction in return for infrastructure. Um, they're, they're not very good deals, um, but what's really wrong with them uh, is not the linking of resource extraction to infrastructure, it's the fact that China's the only one doing it. It's a monopolist. And uh, if you're a monopolist offering a deal, um, it, you, you, you know, China's at the right end of it. And of course, uh, China has a much better sense of what the value of these natural assets are than, uh, than the governments they're dealing with. There's a simple technology, institutional technology, which I discuss in the book, um, which is auctions. Um, the great advantage of auctions is that the government doesn't know, doesn't need to know what the stuff is worth. As long as you've got bidding competition between informed companies, then their competition inadvertently reveals the true value. When I was in Zambia recently, the, uh, I talked with the tax authorities. They said, oh, the, the, the copper companies have got all the best accountants in the country. You know, they, there's a huge asymmetry between the government and the copper companies. But if you get international copper bidding against Global Copper Incorporated, and a few other copper companies, inadvertently they reveal to the government what the true value is. Right? Now, when it comes to these resource extraction in return for infrastructure deals, rather than say to China, don't do that, which of course it ignores, what we need is, is that same framework, an, an auction in which different consortia bid in terms of how much infrastructure they provide. If China still wins those deals, fine. China's revealed as providing the best value. But I, if I were a finance minister, a prudent finance minister in these countries, I'd be quite tempted by the Chinese link between resource extraction and infrastructure, because in one sense, it bypasses a lot of the governance issues that I face. If, imagine me, a prudent finance minister, and uh, and the IMF says, oh, don't do it this way. You, you sell the resource extraction rights for money, you put the money in the budget, and then you buy the infrastructure. That's how it's supposed to be. And that is the ideal. Right? And then as finance minister, I think, okay, I sell the resource extraction rights, the money comes into the budget, there's the budget, here's the president, and, <laughs> and there's the minister of defense, and the minister of defense looks at the president and he says, or she says, um, the troops are restive. <laughs> and the president looks meaningfully at her and says, I think they'll raise salaries of soldiers. Right? And then the other 30 people around the cabinet table all have similar stories. And so I'm the one voice for saying, but if we, if we spend this on consumption, on recurrent stuff, we're, plundering, we're infringing the rights of the future. We must invest it. Right? And so if I'm a prudent finance minister, I might find the Chinese deals quite attractive that the money that never comes into the budget, what happens is the Chinese build the infrastructure. Right? So the, the problem with the Chinese and infrastructure at the moment is their monopolies. We should, all of us, get into that, get into that act. 
Thank you. Please, sir. Uh, bonsoir. Good evening. My name is Dongo Mebumeta. I'm an assistant researcher at the University of Quebec in Montreal, the Innovation um, Centre. Thank you for your, uh, sp your speech, your talk. I, I came here because I wanted to ask you a question. You um, talked about uh, the plundering of resources what you call these natural resources. Now, I have a question regarding the existence, the past, present, and even future presence of a framework, of a structure, uh, a regulation framework, a management framework of such resources at the international level. We talk today about human rights, about democracy, about uh, environmental threats. Now, regarding natural resources management, would you find legal, economic, cultural, ethical arguments that would justify the existence of such a framework? Because we know the, uh, the actors who are the plunderers, who are the victims. You talked about fish, we could talk about wood, gold, diamonds, and many more. So I have a question regarding a framework that would regulate management at the international level of such um, goods and resources. Oh. Let me reiterate, sometimes the right form of management is not to preserve. I mean, let's take a forest. Sometimes the right thing to do with a forest is chop it down, build a city on it. Right? The inhabitants of London are probably quite glad that at some stage that forest was chopped down. Right? So the, the, the right thing to do isn't always preservation. Building a set of international rules for good management Yes, very much what we need to do to prevent uh, the pillage of the past. What does it take to build a set of international rules? Well, at the moment, um, there is no global governance worth speaking of, right? So what I and others are trying to do is, is build a set of international conventions quietly. This is what the Natural Resource Charter is. It's an attempt to build international convention quietly from citizen pressure. Now, what is that um, set of rules, as it were? Um, it's, it's some of it, the reason I talked my way through that whole decision chain, some of it is actually kind of a little bit technical. It's, a, it's, a, it's about the design of tax systems. It's not just about uh, transparency and, and good governance. That was the right place to start. I'm a big supporter of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, which you surely know about, um, which, which wants to, to, to bring transparency into the revenue flows. That's the right place to start. If you haven't got transparency in revenues, then you've got your answer for all the rest of the decision chain. And the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is a great example of a set of conventions started by just 30 young people in a little NGO. And very rapidly that became a, a, a global convention. Now, in fact, let me, t our inspiration for the resource charter was, um, was the history of how the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative was created because it's, it's actually quite funny and quite encouraging. Um, it's been a huge success. It's gone from zero to over 30 countries signed up to it in just a few years. And if you read um, you know, on the web or the official history, what it says is this initiative was launched by Tony Blair at a big international summit uh, in South Africa. Um, actually, um, he didn't. He did no such thing. Right? What happened was he was going to, going to launch it at a breakfast meeting, but then he got cold feet and uh, stood up and talked about something completely different. Fortunately, the British Civil Service is sufficiently incompetent that they still pressed the release button on the press release. And now we have the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. So uh, 
why is that encouraging? Because if something with as inauspicious a start as that can be such a big success so fast, what if we actually tried? Right? <laughs> so yes, we need this chain of global governance, but, but it, you know, it's not as despairingly impossible as we might think. Please, sir. Thank you, Professor Collier, for your uh, address to us and uh, this a sense of urgency that you bring to this uh, urgent issue. Uh, my name is Farid Ayoub, a recent graduate of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Uh, two questions, if you might tell me. Um, first, you mentioned today in your interview with Evan Solomon that you uh, sent a, an advance copy to Prime Minister Cameron. Uh, so my first question is, have you sent it to also all other G8 and G20 leaders? Second question, um, given the purported urgency of other issues, such as uh, fi international finance reform and uh, the con economic crisis, uh, rebalancing budgets, is it too late for the G8, G20 uh, to consider this issue, and uh, the issue of uh, resource extraction? And if not, what would be role of civil society uh, in, the, in the next three weeks, I guess, three weeks to a month before the, the convening of the summit, uh, and what would you suggest us to do? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so first let me share this with uh, the people who didn't see the broadcast. That um, It's not that I sent the book to uh, David Cameron. Um, in January, I got a, a message from him to say, uh, I've read your other books. I hear you've written this one. I know it's not out yet, but he's got to have an advanced copy. Um, I was amazed. I mean, I, I don't know the guy. He, he'd got other things to do. He was, uh, um, uh, and I, I sent it to him. I know he read it, um, because uh, he read what I wrote in it. Um, so but I should say I'm apolitical. Uh, I, I carefully position myself so that I'm not got party political allegiance. But I was very impressed with that. Um, you know, he's obviously a serious guy. Um, you asked me how I sent it to the other G8 leaders. They haven't asked to have it, but, um, uh, but maybe I should send it anyway. Um, uh, but you in Canada uh, can make sure that your Prime Minister reads it. Huh? Um, uh, is, it is it too late? Um, no, of course it's not too late. Um, of course it's not too late. First of all, as I emphasized, Canada, this is the natural issue for Canada. My God, you know, you've got two out of two. You're the resource-rich country, the G8. You're financing the resource extraction. You should take the lead. If not you, who? Who is supposed to take the lead if not you? And here you've got all the world leaders coming. What, do you, what, what else should you be talking about if not that? Huh? I gathered that the reason it was not going to be discussed was it was considered the G8 is only appropriate to talk about economic matters. What do we think this is, right? The billion dollars of gold exports going out of DRC versus the $37,000 going in? If that's not economic, what is, right? And so, of course, Canada should be taking the lead. And of course, your voices matter in making that happen. And if it doesn't get picked up in the G8 this time, let's make enough fuss that a billion dollars has been spent of your money on security for the G8, whilst they've not talked about the damn obvious thing they should have been talking about. Right? And then if that is brought out, why are we spending a billion dollars on theater when there's some serious things to discuss? Then at a minimum, never again will G8s be just theater. Right? Thanks. Thank you. I see there, um, apologies, I see there are two gentlemen with questions. I think we will stop with them. Um, sir, you haven't asked your, you did ask your question just now, so not yet? All right, well, why don't we, uh, if you can be brief, try to get all three of you, but we do need to wrap up in about five minutes. So if you would be brief, we'll start over here. Try to be brief here. Uh, thank you, Professor Collier, for answering our questions. Um, my question basically centers around the challenge of uh, global governance and just international 
rules and regulations in general, and just with capital flight and the ability to move capital where it's most profitable and where companies can make the most money. And uh, even if, you, if one country or a number of countries has the correct regulations in place, they're getting the correct amount of rent for their resources, uh, what are your suggestions for overcoming the challenges of companies just being easily able to just set up shop across countries? Yeah, it is a weakest link problem. Um, and that's why we need to build uh, international awareness. Now, it's not overwhelmingly difficult because it, in this case, it's not, there are only a limited number of countries that are in the resource extraction business. Um, uh, and, and awareness has to be built in those countries. It's not ethically very challenging. Right? The, the figures I gave you, um, you don't have to be a saint to feel that that is plunder is wrong. Right? And so we're not trying to... Um, this is nothing like as ethically demanding as reducing carbon emissions to save the 22nd century. This is reducing theft in order to save the poorest people on earth to give them an opportunity of modest prosperity. Right? Um, you, you have to be a block of stone not to think that that's ethically important and that we better do something about it. Um, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks for uh, taking my question. I just have one quick one. Talk about the, uh, the links in the chain and a uh, critical mass of people to, uh, to make the decisions go right. In, and this is in reference to the bottom billion countries. How, how, how does that happen when, you know, in some of these repressive states, a group of people don't have their say and, and they can't influence a government's decision making? How, how can those people uh, voice their concerns to the government so they listen? That's why I gave the example of China. Um, pressure can work. On, in China, it can work in most places. Of course, there are limits, but the, here, here the future is on our side, right? The, the, the ability of ordinary people to organize is increasing, and what's more, um, it's not even necessarily a matter of, um, of forcing governments to do things. Um, a lot of the time, it's that governments just don't understand the proper decision chain. And so it's, it's building that critical mass of people who understand, and that includes the government officials, the senior civil servants, and so on. It's building understanding. Um, I can't resist one minute on Ghana, which is uh, a democratic country with good economic governance, which in, 19, in, in 2006 discovered oil. This was as good as it gets in Africa. And in the following three years, that oil got plundered by the present against the future. Before any oil had come out of the ground, two-thirds of the entire value of the oil had been spent in a vast scramble of an orgy of spending. Right? Now, that wasn't, um, that wasn't theft. It was folly. Um, and it was because there wasn't this critical mass of understanding within the civil service, within the political parties. That has to be built. I, one of my friends is the, was the vice presidential candidate in Ghana. He was put on the ticket as a technocrat because he'd been the deputy governor of the central bank. You know? Some countries, they choose as their vice presidential candidate technocrats. Um, other countries closer to you don't always choose that as their vice president. <laughs> Um, but anyway, what he says is the vital thing to have avoided that disaster in Ghana would have been to build this mass of understanding in the senior ranks of the political parties early in the process so that both parties could have pledged that whatever else they did, they would respect the decision chain. If there had been a natural resource charter then, they could have both pledged to adhere to it. Thank you, Paul. Sir? Thanks. My name is Asif Chida. Thanks for taking my last question here. I'm referring to the case, I mean, you have been talking about uh, being plundered. I'm talking about a country has been already plundered. A tiny uh, nation in uh, South Czech Republic of Nauru had uh, phosphate as its natural resources. 30 years back, per capita income was about $30,000. 
Today it is just $300 and poverty has increased. So in your link, where should the future generation to talk about a country which has been already prepared? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a chilling question on which to end. Um, I've been working on Haiti a lot in the, the last little while. Um, Haiti's big asset was its forests. They've all gone. They've gone. Right? Across the border in Dominican Republic, there's forests in Haiti all plundered. Right? I talked to the finance minister of the Cameroon uh, three or four months ago. He said he, he understood the decision, Shane, or he went through it. And then he looked really crestfallen. He said, what happens if, if you've already run down the oil and you've just spent it on consumption? What then? What then? It's too late. Right? Our challenge, fortunately, remember those figures. Only $23,000 or so has been discovered. There's another $100,000 per square kilometer to go. Our challenge is not to lament the past, it's to learn from it and make sure that this next $100,000 doesn't go the way of, of the past. No more countries like the example you gave. Thank you. Great, Paul, thank you very much. <laughs> Talking, um, Talking about Haiti about uh, 15 years ago, I was writing about Haiti and I remember ask, asking um, uh, an international figure about Haiti's economy and we were talking about its exports and he said sort of um, quite matter-of-factly, well of course Haiti's principal export is people. By the time your principal export is people, you're in very, very serious trouble. And that's happened to a number of states that haven't actually been able to uh, prove good custodians for their uh, natural riches or uh, good nurturers of uh, local enterprise. Um, I think it's obvious to all of you why we were so pleased that Paul Collier agreed to participate in the Think Tank Initiative's International Advisory Group for uh, Canada's International Development Research Centre. It's uh, given that we operate on quite a small scale, um, terrific uh, asset to have uh, advisors like Paul Collier willing to work with us and uh, for us uh, to be able to leverage your Canadian taxpayers dollars by working with several other funders in order to make meaningful things happen in developing countries uh, in research in the developing countries is just tremendously exciting for those of us involved thank you for joining us this evening Thanks,